Okay, so yeah, okay, so welcome everyone to the Manchester Diana community. Uh, this is the JBM lunch. We've been running these for a few months now since lock, lockdown kicked in back in March. Um, yeah, we just want to say, first of all, thank you to our sponsors for this event who are called Jurors. They help um, pay our meal fees. So we really appreciate that. Um, today we've got Nicholas Frankel. He's going to be talking to us about um, containerizing Java applications. So, I mean, there's no more to say from me ultimately. So I'll hand over to Nicholas. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks for having me, Nick. Uh, thanks everybody to uh, give me some of the time. So yeah, the idea is to show you the different ways to containerize a Java application. And I'm Nicola Frankel. Uh, for 18 years, I've been a consultant holding different technical roles. And since two years, I'm a developer advocate. And yeah, being a developer advocate allows me to spend some stuff uh, on which I, I couldn't spend before when I was a consultant. And right now it's a lot about containerization and Docker and Kubernetes and all this stuff. I work for a company called Hazelcast. So uh, who has heard about Hazelcast before? Great. Uh, that's already something. And I assume you probably have used the INDG, which is like uh, in memory data grid distributed data structures. Um, there is also as well as JET, uh, and we do stream processing and we leverage the IMDG for distribution of our nodes in a network. But today it's not about that. Mm. Today is about containerization. So I'm not a Python developer, so please uh, don't whip me. But um, if you want to uh, containerize a Python app, it will probably look something like that. Uh, you install your dependencies, uh, you run your script and it's done. Um, if you have the same stuff with Node.js, it's also pretty straightforward. Now with Java, we have several additional layers um, because yeah, scripting language, there is no like intermediate format, just like bytecode, what you see is well, just what you run. When you build a Java app in the real world, so without containers, uh, you actually need two additional steps. The first step is you compile your source to bytecodes, and then you build the jar. And a kind reminder that the jar is just a zip with a standard structure, but that would be your unit of deployment in, outside the, the container world. So if we want to do the same, uh, in Docker, that would probably be something akin to that. You like inherit from an image that has a GDK because you need to compile. Um, I assume that you inherit from an image that has Maven, then you package it, then you run your jar, and that's basically it. As an alternative, um, I will show you afterwards. But there are a couple of issues. And um, the first one is, well, I embedded a GDK. I embedded a GDK in my final image. So not only it's like too much size, but do you really want your image to compile Java code in production? That's probably not the good stuff. Um, that's something stupid, but there is there can be a mismatch between the jar, the version of the jar that you are trying to run and the image of the version. It depends how you will take it. It can be a good thing. It, well, can be a not so good thing. In all cases, it's, it's manual now. And as you know, like uh, manual actions um, increase the risk of mistake. And finally, there is no layering, meaning that if you change any of your source, you will need to rebuild the image. And if you are a consumer of this image, you will need to re-download everything. So this is it. And here as an alternative, you can create the jar outside of Docker, but I, I don't believe that's a good idea. In all cases here, I want to show you how it works. I've created an application. This is a pretty stupid application. This is Spring Boot application. I assume that you are familiar with Spring Boot. I've used uh, start.spring.io. 
So I have a web layer. I'm using Hazelcast, of course, because I want to show you how it works a bit. And then I have the Spring Boot Maven plugin. So nothing really, really hard. This is my application. So here, I just need to be like careful because if I'm running inside a container, I need to change the networking a bit, but nothing really hard. I like Hazelcast is uh, baked in into the, the, the Spring Boot auto configuration. So I just need uh, to tell, uh, I need a Hazelcast instance and one will get um, like created for me by Spring Boot. And then I have my person controller. So these greetings IMAP is just a hash map that is distributed outside of the GVM of this one. And I have a get mapping that returns me all the contents of this IMAP. And I have a put mapping that allows me to store one person inside this IMAP. And I have a stupid entity that has two members. So if I just want to run it here, the first thing is I need to start Hazelcast. So that's, sorry, <clears throat> that creates a node. I can create more nodes, but here it's not necessary. Then I start this application outside of Docker. So as a client, it connects to the nodes. And then I can, so I have my nodes for that. I can put, let's say I already have John. Oh, not here, not here. Here I will put Henry. So Henry has been put and now I can curl and say HTTP local hosts 8080 and it returns me the whole content. That's, that's really stupid. That will be my app that I want to containerize. So as I mentioned, the first thing is what we can do is we can, sorry, up, uh, we can uh, MVN clean package. So I will create this package. So I will create this jar and the next step, and I prepared it because I'm super lazy. This is my Docker file. That's exactly what I showed you in the slides. It's not super rocket science. And then of course you can run it. Nope, here. And I can curl again and check that I can get to hassle cost the content. And yeah, the not so fun stuff is that here version 0 0.5 is here. It's quite heavy, it's not super good, but it's better than nothing. And the biggest issue here is that, well, I have one like manual action, I need to use MVN clean package, and then I build my image. So that's two uncorrelated steps. Uh, I manage the version here, but again, manual mismatch, it's not, not super great, but it's a good first step. So the next step is to do everything inside of Docker. I believe you know enough about Docker. I'm copying like these MVN stuff, MVN wrapper, and then I'm copying the pond and I'm copying the source. I don't do want to do the test because I'm lazy and okay. But the, the hardest problem is I'm still uh, using uh, a GDK, so I can still compile stuff. Next step is to start with multi stage builds. Multi stage builds are, are much more interesting because I can, I can decouple the building part from the running part. I can have, have as many steps as I want. And here I will be building from a GDK. And then I will start from a completely different image. So I, I start from, uh, 
fuck, sorry, each, ah, sorry, yes, it's a GRE. I was a bit afraid that it would be a GDK and I did a mistype, but it's a GRE. So I start from a GRE. I don't have any more uh, compilation um, capacities. And then I just take from the previous step, this jar. And there are several ways to reference those steps. So first, uh, the previous steps, but the last, they need to be labeled. And the second is you can, of course, reference their sequence number, which I believe is not a great idea, or you can reference the name. That's, that's already something better. Um, but at this point, we, we, we can still see there, there is an issue. As I mentioned, let's check that it works. Sorry, I have an issue with that. We can run this one. Did I stop it? No, Docker stop has all cause greet. No, not greet, greet. Yes. So if I run this one and I check, it should still work. Nope. Yes, it took a bit of time to stop it. So it's still working. Now, so far, I have improved my, the security. I've improved the size of my build because there are two different, uh, two different uh, build steps. I still have an issue with the layers. If I check the layers, uh, I think I will go here to check the size of the layer. I will use dive and I will use spring in the, uh, it's this one. So we can see that we still have a single jar. So even though we are we are running in like a, a, a GRE, we, we still have a single jar, which means that if we change a source file, that we need to rebuild the whole image. And in Maven, that means like probably redownloading the whole stuff. Um, which is not a good idea. Also, I, I don't know if you use scaffold. Do, do, you, do you use Kubernetes and do you use scaffold? Nope. Uh, scaffold is a cool tool. So if you are, if you are using Kubernetes, uh, the problem is like building your image every time and deploying to Kubernetes. And we want to automate that. So scaffold lets you do that automatically. So you just configure scaffold. I don't know to use JIP, for example, that I will explain afterwards or a Docker file or whatever. And every time you change your application, it will use the Docker file or JIP or whatever to rebuild the image and automatically deploy it inside your local Kubernetes cluster or an other cluster if you don't want to use uh, the local one. Um, that the multi-stages builds, they are not compatible with, with uh, scaffold. So if you are a Kubernetes developer, well, it, it's not, not super nice. So the next step is to go a bit further. And to start using layers. And that's actually much better. Because now we have dedicated layers. The first ones are the palm and all the Maven wrapper stuff. And the second one are the sources. Meaning that if we change the sources here, then this layer is still there. It's still valid, it's still good. So we don't need to reload everything. Uh, may, um, Docker will use it and we will just like need to run that. Yes, there is a question. No, I thought there was a question. Please feel free to ask any question. So far, so good, I assume. Okay, so that's the next step. We can check that it still works because it's important. I'm too fast every time. 
So it's still working, that's fine. But now if you notice that uh, every, every application, every Java application would actually be exactly the same. If you have uh, an application that uses the Maven wrapper, that would be the same in every one. You could actually create a template out of it and just change the name here and the name here and the name here. But the, the rest is completely the same, like from, from application to application. So it stands to no reasons to uh, duplicate it every time. And that's what the people at Google uh, found out is, yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. And for that, they provide a plugin, a Maven plugin. There is all, it's all also available in Gradle if you are a Gradle lover. I'm not a Gradle lover. I actually hate Gradle. Um, so I will show you everything in Maven. And this is called the Jib Maven plugin. And the Jib Maven plugin actually lets you do that. It, it's able to understand your main class. You don't need to provide your main class. And it runs not in a jar. It runs in exploded formats. Um, so I will just uh, show you the command line. This is what we can do. I, I won't do it because the image has already been built. But you just like invoke this Docker build stuff. And if you are lazy like me, you can like run it in uh, like configure it inside of here. So you can have an execution that say Docker build. There are two targets. The first one sends the image that you created to a registry. So you configure the registry. By default, it would be Docker Hub. Um, but you can use another one. And this Docker build command sends you to, to the local Docker daemon. So here, I don't want to send it to Docker Hub and then redownload it again. I just send it to my local Docker daemon, and it's good enough. And this allows the following. Um, dive. I just need, uh, it's the spring in Docker. I think it's the 2.0. Yes. So you can see <laughs> this is Bezel. So probably it comes from Google because only Google is using Bezel. And here you can see the Maven G plugin. And you can see that they already have some layers. So the first layers, like the, the, the bottom most layer are the libraries because in general, in your projects, libraries are uh, the components that change less than others. Then afterwards are snapshots libraries because snapshot libraries, they can be updated every now and then. And you need, uh, well, to get the latest snapshots. So that's another layer. Then you have your resources because they might change pretty often. And finally, you have the classes because they can also change pretty often and probably more often than the previous one. So by default, when you use JIP, you already have a perfectly layered application image. And, and the good thing is it's, it's really interesting. Like you, if you are all like me and uh, well, I'm sorry, but we are all pretty of the same age. So that means we are pretty old. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, we are pretty experienced. We are pretty senior. Um, you, you have been uh, using jars as your delivery units and it makes sense. But now it has become ingrained in our brain that um, that's the thing to deploy. But now we are in, in a containerized world and now the deployment unit becomes a container. And so the jar inside the container is just an, like an extra wrapper that doesn't bring anything, that doesn't bring anything at all, because everything that you need, you can run in exploited formats. So of course, if you don't use containers, you wouldn't just send like a bunch of, of classes and resources and jars and say, hey, like just run this command line. The jar makes it like easy uh, to, uh, to, the, to, to deliver something. But with the containers, you can replace the jars. The jars doesn't need uh, to happen anymore. The good thing with JIB is that if you want to change your parent image, and actually the default image is not that great, 
uh, we can we can use Alpine, for example, and it's just like a configuration away. You just say, hey, now I want like to inherit from Alpine. And if we do this uh, Docker image, grab spring, we can, hey, Docker images. We can see that the difference between 2.0 and 2.1, so between like the default parent image and the, the, the Alpine is like 40 megs. It's not small potatoes. I mean, it's quite good. So you, you can perhaps uh, like uh, have a very, very specific image that you want to use, the one that is very small. And, and it would be like the smallest image ever that can, you can ever create. Any questions on JIP or on jars or on containers? Good, then I can continue. Because, um, yeah, that's not the end of it, folks. That's the problem. That's never the end of it. Um, Spring Boot. Uh, proper uh, introduce you this concept of layer jars. So now we can we 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 get we get back one step, we get back again to the realm of Docker files, and Spring Boot tells you, hey, but look, we already have layer jars by ourselves. That's true, actually. Now our uh, Docker files is a three steps file. The first one is we actually like build the jar like normally. The second step, we explode the jar. So we have a specific command to get the jar and to like do what Jib did for us to like separate the different layers. But the layers, they are, they are a bit different than the one provided by Jib. Uh, the first one is the dependencies one, which is like the libraries for Jib. The second one is the snapshot dependencies, because for the same reason, like the, the libraries, they are pretty, well, they are like immutable normally. They are immutable. And then the snapshot dependencies, they might be unstable. I mean, that's the reason for them to be snapshot. The third layer is not um, the, the, the resources. It's the Spring Boot lawyer itself. So it's the Spring framework itself. And also the fact that they have a dedicated class loader and all the stuff. And the fourth layer is actually the application, meaning it's the classes and the properties. So for them, uh, both of them can change as much as, I mean, they, 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 change, they have the same probability of being changed. Um, mm -hmm. And yes? I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so I did something like this on one of my projects at work. Um, and I don't know if this is a common error, but on my application layer, when I publish it to, well, when it does the build, it quite often says the layer does not exist. But if I run the build again, it works a second time. So I wonder, is that a common problem or is it something I'm probably doing wrong? Uh, since, I mean, it's hard to debug something. I don't have the sources. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, um, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I can, I can, I can run it here. Uh, you will see it's straightforward. Uh, let me get back here. And I will run it into this window. Of course, here it's already cached. Uh, so let's change something. Uh, I will, I will uh, add a space here. So you see that. Uh, it didn't download the dependencies again because everything was still here. It just did the stuff at the end. So that, that's the benefit of, of having those layers. And in that case, the layers, they are uh, like not specific to Spring Boots. I will dive into it, the Spring in Docker 3.0. And here you can see the layers here. So the Jackson one, and then the Hazel class one, and then the Spring Boot loader, class loader, and then my application. And if you want to have your own layers, because perhaps you want to separate between the properties and the, and the classes, um, then you need 
to change the layer dot index. The, this is the, the stuff that you need to change. And here I, I didn't mention it, but here you can really see like a, a, a multi-step Docker build in action. You can see the only thing that I did that are present in this image are my layers and the parent image. And that is exactly what is what is here. You don't see any Maven stuff or yeah, it's everything is is like pretty constrained. So next step is well. <laughs> Now you might know about these uh, new cloud native build packs. Uh, did any of you hear about cloud native build packs? Okay, um, so um, perhaps you, you remember something called the Iroku, it's still existing. And if you create uh, like uh, Iroku, sorry, is the cloud provider. It, like uh, it allows you to run your application deployed in the cloud. And the good stuff with Iroku is basically you could um, like send its sources. Uh, it has, it had, it still has a Git repository. So it would like from your Git repository build your uh, artifacts because it's, it can sniff out which kind of stuff it is. So it's easy. It says, oh, it's, it, there is a palm. Mm, it must be, it must be Maven. Or, oh, there is a build.gradle. Oh, it's a Gradle build. Or I don't know, there is a package.json. Oh, it's a Node.js application. And it it's did it for ages. So it, it's quite easy. You just like create your application, you host it on like as you, you host your sources, it's Git repository and a Heroku. And then you just set it, oh yeah, deploy it on two, three nodes, whatever. And poof, it, it's done. It's really magical. And it seemed as if um, like Heroku didn't have like many change, chances in the world against Google or against the biggest cloud provider. But the, the fun part is that VMware the, the, or Tensu, I don't, I don't know how they should be called today. They, they try to do the same for their, for their cloud hosting and they, they partner together. And now they, they have created a project called Cloud Native Build Packs uh, that do the same for, well, cloud native applications. And so um, you can have uh, that inside your own infrastructure. And this is how it looks. So you have, um, perhaps, is it big enough? Can I perhaps, do you see it here? Is it big enough for you or should I make it bigger? Because, uh, yeah, no, fine, okay. So I will assume that works for you. And so you have this uh, like common lines here. So it's which called pack and you tell it which builder you will need to use. And this builder is the one that's able to sniff eh? that it's Java stuff. And let's see how it works. Normally it should be pretty fast, but because I already, it's already cached. But I, I never know. That's one of the stuff that I, I never know if it will be fast or not. <clears throat> so, so far, so good. It's quite fast enough. And now it does this detecting of, of, of what it is. So it tells me, ah, oh, you, have, you have a Maven, you have a Maven palm. Oh, it's, it, I will like, like, pull uh, the Maven and, oh, I, I see you have a Tomcat dependency in Maven. Oh, I will pull the Tomcat stuff. Oh, you have, I see you have Spring Boot and, and so on and so forth. And so it's able to detect a lot of your projects and to, to build the right image for you. Um, and I built it with the wrong one, which is good because uh, I should have uh, like, no, it's the right one. So why did it fail? Uh, spring in Docker 3.0. I don't remember. I, I don't understand why, but there might be a slight discrepancy between here and what I'm doing. But anyway, uh, and <clears throat> in the end, the result is actually that uh, it can work pretty well as well. But the image is harder to configure than the previous one because it's a lot about like automatically detecting. And so, um, you don't have the same level of control as before. 
and I will just check that it works. Yeah, it is still there. And of course, I don't forget to stop it. Otherwise, it won't work last time. So now if I check a version 4.0, for example, I didn't get to choose the parent image. And so the, 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 the weight of the image is quite high compared to what I wanted to have. Um, there, there, there are ways to change the parent image, but actually the parent image must be compatible, meaning that it must be labeled in such and such a way. And actually, for example, if you say, hey, I want to run on Alpine, well, it, it's, it's not possible. Um, so it, it, it's, it's more restricted, but it's more magic. The next step is to uh, do that, but without the command lines. So we, we can, Ah, yeah, that's, that's, that was this version. That was this version 4.0 that uh, didn't work. So this is this version that I wanted to show you. That's why there was a, it, the build didn't work. Um, so now I, I want to uh, actually do that, but without the command line, because I'm super lazy again. And the Spring Boot Starter plugin, it's exactly, I'm sorry, the Spring Boot um, Maven plugin, that's exactly what it does. It will use uh, the cloud native build pack, but under the cover. You don't need to install an extra layer, an extra tool. You just use, sorry, build image here, MVN Spring Boot build image, and it will do that for you. So now I hope I'm in the right tank. Blah, 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 blah. And you, you can see, it uses the same image, the same default image, but it's inside, inside the command line. And of course, now everything is cached. So it does the exam same stuff that it did before. And it says, oh, I detected uh, Spring Boot, blah, 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 everything the same. And in the end, you also have an image. And if we check the size, we can see that it's also, where is my 5.0? It's the same size as the 4.0. So they are exactly using the same. It's just that you can do it inside of Maven without tying your fingernails, which is like super comfortable. The good thing, as I mentioned, is it can sniff stuff um, and it's able to configure uh, different uh, configuration depending on, on just the slight parameter. So I, really like native images. I really like them because they are smaller in size. They are, well, as the name imply, native. Uh, I want to do a smart checkout because I want to keep that. I just found, that, uh, found out that this was pretty cool. So I will need to change the code and push it after this talk. I had, I had an issue because I, I want this application to run uh, inside of Docker and outside of Docker. And of course, if I run inside of Docker, I need to change the network configuration of my Hazelcast client. But anyway, so I, I need to add that to the uh, repository after that talk. Anyway, um, right now, what I just want to do is I add one environment variable and I just say like compile, compile it to Graal native. And I, it's take, it, it will be taking ages, so I, I won't show it, but if I found it in the stuff that I did just before, yes, that's what I did just before the talk. As you can see, it's, it takes a long, long time, but uh, the sniff that it will do, uh, sorry, it's getting there. So it, it, it will sniff. And it will sniff that, hey, I'm using Spring Boot, but I'm also using GraalVM and probably, hey, just add the Spring Boot native image. And now we've got like a native, native process. And this native process is the 5.5. .5. And as you can see, it's like much smaller than the one that we did with the full GVM. So benefits of running in the cloud is that it starts without uh, having to warm up the GVM and the memory consumption is like much lower. On the opposite side, if you have a long running process, then 
the GVM is not there, so it's not able to adapt the uh, compiled codes to the workloads. And so it depends on how you compile your application. And the benefit is, yeah, you just edit those like this configuration and now it's a native image. Whereas if you want to compile a native image and without that, you need to provide a specific Docker file. And if you're interested, in, I can show you the kind of Docker file that you need to create. And it must be into this repository. And this is the kind of stuff that you need to do. Like you need to say, okay, first I need to create the jar. Then I need to uh, download the correct Graal VM. And I need to install the native image because remember that by default, uh, Graal uh, has not a native image installed. So you need to install it and you need to create the native image, blah, blah, blah. Okay, in the end, the benefit is yeah, then you can start from scratch. It's also a nice benefit. Because again, here you don't have the choice of the parent image. So whether you want it or not, uh, you must choose between like a, a panel of, of images that are compatible. And so far, I didn't find any but the one provided. And I believe uh, that's all. So yeah, I didn't show any of the slide, but that's exactly what I wanted to show you. And yeah, I, I did a small experiment. Perhaps uh, you know about. Um, a, a, a tool called Docker Squash. And Docker Squash allow you to, to flatten your layers. Uh, sorry. And I, I thought it was it would be very cool to do that. Um, but actually the gain, the actual gain um, for the images is very, very low. Um, so I, I don't think that it would be really good to squash your layers. Better keep all your layers so that it's easier to download if the top layers the change, then you keep the lower layers. Then to say, oh, I want the smallest image ever. You squash everything, you don't gain that much, and then you need to download everything again. Um, so in this talk, I try to show you several uh, pain points between uh, Docker and, and the Jive, and sorry, the build system. So the first one, if you are using a Docker file, uh, be careful about syncing the POM and the image. It's not something you want to do manually. Sometimes you would want to do it, sometimes not, but there is a high risk of a discrepancy. Uh, be careful about your layers. So even if you don't use JIP, if you just think about your Docker file and organize your layers so that your dependencies are at the bottom and dependencies, they don't change that much and your sources, they are at the top because your sources they change a lot. And yeah, don't use Squash because it's not that useful. So thanks for your attention. Uh, you can read my blog at blog.frankel.ch. I uh, publish weekly blog posts on Sunday evenings. You can follow me on Twitter. That's always appreciated. If you want to um, like play with the example that I've showed you, everything is on GitHub. So there is this uh, nice bit.ly uh, link. And if you are interested in Hazelcast and you want to know more, of course, you can always ping me on Twitter. My DM are open, but also you can join our Slack. And then my boss will be happy and he won't fire me and I will be paid and I will be able to go to other meetups. And uh, yeah, now is the time for questions. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, has anybody got any questions they'd like to? Sure. Don't be shy, folks. Remember, oh. I, I'm used to talking to my screen. So nice human interactions. I've got, I've got a question. Man. So you know when you did the Docker file and you put all the layers in it? Yes. Is that doing the same as what the jib library does for you? Actually, the, the jib plugin does it in a much better way. Because okay. um, here, in the... Uh, lowest part of the Docker file. So if I get back, no, get, ah, it's not the right one. Uh, get, 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 um, here, layer multi-stage builds. Check out this one, ah, stop it. Uh, wait, two seconds, don't check out. I will do a git, no. Git stash, yes, so now. It's better. 
local changes, shelf, log. Yes, here, checkout. Here, what I'm doing is I'm adding like only two layers. I'm having the layers of Maven and dependencies, and I am having the layer of sources and properties. So basically with this, I will only have two layers. And we can see that if I dive, if I dive spring in Docker 1.2. It's not the right one. Ah, I don't have it. Ah, it's stupid. Here I, I have a single jar. So here I, I, I'm, I have the jar and here on the previous image, I have my uh, dependencies. But what JIP does, so I will be in 2.0. So it, it completely removes the jar, the jar wrapper, and you have directly your layers here and you have not only two, but you have four layers. You have the libraries, you have your snapshot libraries, you have your resources, and you have your classes. Because they infer that it will be from the most changing to the least changing. So, so does it's even the structure of a Spring Boot application then? Is it specifically for Spring Boot or for any Java? No, that's for any Java application. So you can, you can of course, use JIP for Spring Boot, but for any Java application, it will work like that. But it must know about Spring Boot to know and understand Spring Boot's layers, no? No, the, here, that's, okay, there, there is a slight confusion. The Spring Boot, the latest version of Spring Boot, they add another way of, of doing stuff. So you first create your jar, then you explode it into by default four layers, but those are not the same layers. So I will just do a dive here, a dive here. I will stop that. I will dive here and Spring Boot is 4.0 dive. It's Spring in Docker, Spring in Docker 4.0. Come on. Hey, yes. Why don't I don't see the same stuff? Uh, sorry, it's not the right one. It's 3.0. Yes, now I can see better. Uh, here you, you see uh, the layers, but they are not the same one. Here, the first layer is also the dependencies. Those are the same. Here, snapshot dependencies, also the same. Here, Spring Boot class loader specific stuff. So remember, in, in JIP, those were the properties layers, the resources. And the last is both the properties and the classes at the same time. And here I need, so if I want to have this kind of stuff, I need to get back to the Docker file stuff. Jeep doesn't understand Spring Boot by default. So if you want to have those layers, you need to remove Jeep to get back to the Docker file and to do that by yourself. So you need to have those three steps the first step, I create the jar. The second step, stupid, but that's how it works. You need to extract the jar, to explode the jar, just like, like Tomcat does. And the third is you need to map each of the, the, the folders that were extracted to the layer you want in the order that you want. Because here, nothing prevents me from doing that, which would be very stupid, but it's, it's a way to do it. I suppose it's... Um... Like thinking about the two approaches, Jib feels like it's um, abstracting Docker from you somewhat. So you're working from a Maven plugin, building an under the hood that's going to build a Docker file. It's going to make decisions for you about your layering. Whereas yes. the Spring Boot layering tools approach is more you're in control of the Docker file. You'll decide what your layers are. So they both kind of solve the same problem, but one is a bit more of an opinionated approach. Yes, exactly. Control you need to kind of make sure you get it right. 
Um, I imagine that will probably kind of evolve anyway in terms of tooling. I, I hope so because yeah, uh, I expect from Spring Boot uh, to care about like to do that for me, which is in that case not doing. I need to yeah. create the Docker file by myself, and on the other way, um, I'm able if uh, to to create more layers. If I want more layers, I can do whatever I want. Uh, like I have the default extract here, but I can create um, it's it's an index. I don't remember the name of. Yeah, these layers dot IDX, I can provide it into my sources and I can say, hey, here, this is how I want uh, the jar to be constructed. And so when you extract it, you will have the exact layout that you want and then you can map it. But for me, the, the worst stuff is, is this because you, you I mean, if yeah. it's just super easy uh, to change the order and, and to shoot yourself like stupidly in the foot. Yeah, so it's always going to boil down to one of those. It depends on what your preference is in terms of the approach. Yes. I think. But, uh, but so if, you are, if you are super lazy, I would I would just like go for the latest one and 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 use um, the 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 build image command, and then it does it for you. Mm. On the opposite yeah. side, hey, you don't get to choose your parent image. And that I really, really hate because the default images are always, in my opinion, super bloated. Whereas in, in um, even in JIP, the default image is uh, one that doesn't have a shell at all. So it's already quite small, not super small, just like Alpine, but like already quite small, acceptable, let's say. Mm. I think what, what you might also find often is, um, what, you know, if you're working in the open and just playing around, you can, you've got access to all these things just easily. If you're in an organization, you might be a bit more constrained around what you can use and how you can build things. So that might kind of influence your decision as to whether you can True. use JIT or you have to use, you know, maybe, maybe build, you know, the cloud native build packs might be the only option that your organization is kind of channeling you down. Or it might be that you've got freedom of the Docker file and you can yeah, optimize the way and do it the way you want, which is, I suppose it's just going to be different, isn't it? Organization by organization, I think. And uh, yes, uh, context by context. I completely agree yeah. that uh, yeah, in our, in our job, it's a lot of it depends. So uh, I, I try to, in this talk, I try to, to present you with every options that I know of. Um, and then you can decide which one you, you, you are interested in, which, which one you, you would like to use in your context. I believe the more tools you have around your tool belts, then yeah, the, the, the better professional you are because you can make enlightened choices uh, and, and have like context dependent decision. Yeah, uh, we've got any other questions from anybody? Uh, yeah, I just have one actually. Um, maybe I should switch my camera on. And it's been so long. I think I've forgotten how. Uh, where are we? Start video. Oh, there we go. There's me. Hi. Um, so, one question I have then when you're talking about exploding your jar effectively. Um, one reason, apart from packaging an app together with its dependencies, is that jars make things very easy to run in your production environment and it keeps your sort of your running script simple if you build an executable jar or a fat jar. Um, if you're extracting it all, um, and forgive me if this is a stupid question, but does anything become more complicated in the runtime in sort of in terms of managing the running application? If you're just throwing all of the classes together. Um, the, the thing is, um, I don't believe so. Um, like, imagine, okay, um, I try to make it clear, but um, I, I will try to find another stuff because I, I'm not sure it's clear. The jar is not, a, a, for me, the jar is the deployment in it. You could actually run a Java application by just like writing the class pass. Uh, directly. Uh, and as you mentioned, it's really shit to do that. You, you don't want to do that. But uh, if I'm using um, 
jib jib uh, i removed it so let me please get back here and i can and docker jib was the two dot one so here i will just need to run it and i will just show you the command line it it uses to do that um so i just need to remove rm automatically because otherwise it will be took ah, docker stop has a cost greet and the cost greet okay now uh, docker stop has a cost greet okay docker pso so now i need to do no trunk and you can see that here java cp app resources app classes app libs and nothing prevents you from uh, like in your palm adding additional uh, gvm parameters so everything is taken care out for you the the command line is actually uh, easier i don't know if you, if you have worked with uh, like junior developers or students before, and they are used to uh, using dash cp to use the class path, and then you tell them about the jar, and they do the same. They do dash cp, and then nothing works anymore, because with jar cp dot I mean has no effect. So it's actually much harder to understand that why in one case you use the class path of the command line, and in the other case you use the class path of the manifest, which in in case you never do because class pass of the manifest is actually absolute <laughs> and you don't want to do it in that. So um, now that if, if you are in, uh, running in a containerized environment, uh, you can remove this jar wrapper and use the, the, the Docker container as your deployment unit, which contains every um, like command line parameters you need. And if if your application is smart, if you need to deploy into different environments, of course, then you can pass instead environment variables, and then your application needs to the app. In this case, I'm doing this, or in that case, I'm doing that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, it's a reflex we have. We say, oh, the jar has served well for that many years. It's the solution. Uh, now, if you run in, containers and I, I would really challenge that opinion and yeah perhaps it will take some time to get used to it but i believe that uh, jars are not the format the, the correct format for i would say cloud world but at least for the containerized world anymore okay so it, in fact it actually handles any extra config or changes like that it's all done for you yes yeah, the, the, the fun part is yeah. um by default, Jib tries to sniff your main class. If it doesn't, it's able to, not able to sniff it automatically. So here, it's it, it's deduced it automatically. If it's not, it will tell you, "Hey, I cannot build the container. Please explicitly provide your main class," and it will do it for you. And everything that you add to those GVM parameters, it will uh, prepend between Java and your class name. The issue is when you need to, for example, to pass um, Spring Boot profiles, which are appended, then you need to write the command line by hand. It's much less fun. Um, that's the only, only stuff that I found, but I, I did it with uh, previous versions of, of Jib plugin. Perhaps now they allow also to, it also allows to, to append as well. Then you are covered on both sides. Okay, thanks very much. You're welcome. Well, kind of in, I suppose, following on from that question, the, there's obviously the benefit of layering, having the exploded jar. Is there any benefit in startup time as well? I don't, I don't Sorry, know. could you please repeat? Uh, um, yeah, so, so with the exploded jar, you have the benefit of lay, layering in your, in your yes. document. Is there also a benefit around startup of your application, or is that just, you know, just... No, no. I will be very honest with you, which made me either a very good or a very bad consultant before, is uh, I didn't measure performance, so I cannot answer that question. 
I guess one thing is it would make your app quicker to deploy, wouldn't it? Because most of the layers would already be on the machine yeah. on the server. So it would have yeah. some speed benefit. Yeah. Yeah, that, that'd be a factor, wouldn't it? Yeah. So in terms of style, maybe not the JVM specifically, but in terms of the overall deployment of an getting it deployed. Yeah, you get the caching benefits of previously deployed layers. Mm. Yeah, yeah, true. Cool. Cool. Well, um, yeah, I think we're kind of coming up to the hour. Um, so Perfect. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for joining us. That was uh, really Thanks for your questions. Really appreciated them. Cool. Excellent. And um, I think uh, we've got our, our next meetup is happening in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll, I'll share some more details on social media. I can't remember the exact date, so I don't want to say it right now. Uh, but I'll uh, share some more details soon. So, yeah, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, and hopefully see you all for the next one. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, folks. Okay. Hope to see you soon in person. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.